The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. traveled we church to church it was 12 years Jennifer and I and is really where a lot of our books came out of it because uh, when you pastor a church you you get tunnel vision you see your church you understand their issues you understand those people but when you travel church to church you see what's out there not just your pastorate and that is the education of a lifetime and those of you that have been around the different churches you know they're different right and there's needs, and there's strengths, and there's weaknesses everywhere. We have our strengths and our weaknesses as well. But when we traveled, I was in kind of an unusual situation. After pastoring 20 years, uh, Jennifer and I we traveled for 12 after pastoring 20 years, one church. Um, and going church to church, I didn't have a piece, and I'm not saying you can't do this, but I never had a piece about asking anybody to come preach at your church. And I had to trust God because that's like if you, can you imagine being in sales but don't, don't go to anybody? <laughs> huh? But in, in, in the kingdom, that's what, that's what he had me do. And here was the, the, the uh, we got one speaking engagement that multiplied, that pastor handed it to other pastors. He recommended we didn't ask to go speak anywhere. And when we were in this time, we would just sit and pray. And, and, and Jennifer and I would just pray together at the same time and, and every morning, and we would just stay. And God gave this word that I never forgot, and I feel like after all these years, I want to preach it. He says, fill up, and I will fill up in the context of your schedule, which he did. He kept us busy seven days a week. Fill up, and I will fill up. Fill full, and I will fulfill your destiny. And therein, and, and really, today's message is not so much fill up so I fill up your schedule. Um, but uh, right now we're trying to sort out what to do, what is God's priority, etc. But really the title today is Fill Full in Order to Fulfill your plan and your purpose. You have to feel full. You've got to cultivate intimacy. It's not about your giftings. And in two cases, you know, we're in the scripture where it says, many will say, Lord, Lord, but they won't enter the kingdom of God. And did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devils? And he'll say, I knew you not. Depart from me. You work lawlessness. So there's, there's a prerequisite that is absolutely essential for all of us to fulfill our destiny. The Lord says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans for welfare, not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Kevin Zadai has an expression, I think he's got a book out right now, uh, where he says basically, it's rigged in your favor. If you really knew the plan that God had for you, it's rigged in your favor. You have to be the enemy that blows it. All right? You have to come up with some creative idea that's not the plan of God to sabotage it, or move in rebellion going, I'm not trying. I'm not doing that. You know, which is highly unusual. And God can restore the years the locust has eaten, so I want to cover the excuses right off the bat in case you say, yeah, but I should have done that a long time ago. Well, too late? No. God can restore the years the locust has eaten, but if you have to let Him do it. He's smart enough that anyone who ever gets off track, so this is a good word for 2020, anyone who gets off track, He can get you back on track. And if you want to hint as to how he goes about it, look at your Bible and find out any scriptures that you wrote in in the early years. Some of the scriptures you wrote in the early years was to keep you on track. You, you might call them favorite scriptures, but in reality it was to get your head screwed on properly. So if ever you get confused or frustrated, go back to the original intent. God will get you back on track. He's that smart. And uh, there's nothing he can't heal or fix. So, in 
<clears throat> Ephesians 3, in the Amplified Translation, it says, May Messiah through your faith actually dwell, settle down, abide, make His permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in the love of God, founded securely on that love, that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all of the saints just what is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of it. But here's the verse 19. This is what I'm praying for us as a church. We are very pro-reality. Head knowledge does not impress me. Uh, as a matter of fact, almost everything we wrote came out of Jennifer's brilliant intellect, but my spiritual experience. We needed both. Amen. One without the other isn't enough. We need both. So God put us together. He was pretty clever, huh? Jennifer says, without me, there wouldn't be any books. But without me, she had nothing to write. So we made a good team. God wants you to be part of something bigger than yourself. God can take a corporate anointing. I was a baby Christian, and pastors came to copy my infrastructure, but I only had four things that God told me to do. And it was, I don't know how to start a church. I don't know what to do. I just know that I was called to do it. God said, first, you teach them their individual identity. Amen. Then, pull the gold out. Recognize the gold. In other words, if you see them in motion, see, people will say, what's my gift? How about you love on people, and I'll tell you what your gift is. If I see you in motion, it's easy to see that you have a predilection toward this or that. The way you love people will determine a lot of your gifting. So individual, individual identity, intimacy with Jesus, knowing Him in reality, not in your head, but knowing Him spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. Then your individual gold and gifting. How you love in the Spirit will also reveal your giftings. Uh, the third area, and he says be patient here because this is the hard one for believers. The third one was corporate identity. That's where the fear comes in. And you're afraid that if I become part of something bigger than me, I will lose my identity. That's insecurity talking. There is a corporate identity to where, and you all have it, it's where you feel a kinship or a knitting relationally. Because God in the book of Acts says, I've appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. Yes. I'm talking geographically even. If you obey God, He has the exact time, which you had, you had no control over when you were born, what generation. But the place that you live is extremely important. There are people that make moves, you need to make moves. There's people that, that, uh, that need to get rooted, you need to get rooted. You need to know where you belong and you want to be in the right place at the right time. That's part of the will of God. But when God says, I've appointed the exact time and the exact place, don't minimize those kinds of changes. Don't minimize that job you don't like. If God sent you there, I always got a kick. I have people in my congregation say, God gave me this job. I know it was, oh, bless God, bless God. He gave me this job. And then two weeks later, I want to quit this job. I hate this job. I'm out of here. That made it sound like if it was God, that he's fickle, right? God doesn't know what he's doing. No, God knows what he's doing. What he's trying to do is saying, why not be the best person on that stinky job? Because then promotion doesn't come from the east or west. It's God that lifts up one and puts down another. I can remember doing, as an unsaved person, doing drugs all the way to the point where I was on welfare. And God had me go with a college education, take a job for less than welfare. And I struggled with it. And I went, and the guy said, I don't want you. And I'm like, Thank you, Jesus. I go home, and God sent me back again the second time. I'm going, oh. he said no. I went back the second time. He goes, no. This was to clean restrooms and mop the floor where the truckers came in. No. I went home, relieved. This is, the, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That was in there from the beginning, and that needs to be in you as well. 
I went back the third time. And he goes, you're hired. And he says, I've never had anybody come three times in the last 40 years that I've been president of this trucking firm. God knew that. I didn't know that. I thought I was just being punished for some crazy reason. I don't know. Three times. I went back in and... The only Christian, they, I know they were doing, they had drugs, hijacking. Sometimes truckers have alternate employment. And uh, one was supposedly rumored to have killed somebody. And I'm in there with the chief guy. Now, this goes back a ways. He had his headband on and his earrings. And he was the, uh, the mechanic, uh, the uh, truck repair manager, whatever. And he sat at a desk and we faced it. And I drove him crazy because I smiled. Now, when I lived in South Chicago, smiling walking down the street could get you beat up. But as a Christian, I couldn't help it. And it was there. And he couldn't stand it. He took a, an expensive watch one time off his wrist and smashed it against the wall. And he says, look at your car. It won't even pass Pennsylvania inspection. It's riveted with rust. What does your God do for you? Look at, you see what I just did? I go buy myself another one. And so I had, I had a, a, a New Testament that was free, that you're supposed to give away free. I said, oh yeah, you never bought nothing from me. <laughs> he goes, what? I said, you never bought nothing from me. You got all this money. Here, give me 10 bucks for this Bible that's supposed to be free. He was, he was so egotistical, he peeled out 10 bucks and took the Bible, put it in his desk. So, you know, that's a start. And he kept calling me Smiley. I mean, they pulled knives on me and everything else. Smiley, they called me. He couldn't stand it. And then I was there cleaning toilets, mopping the floor where the dispatchers came in and the truckers came in to talk to the dispatcher. And the president of the company came and said, um, you know how to do payroll? I go, yeah. You know how to do this? Yeah. You know how to do that? I had an office job within a week. <laughs> within a week, it was, the, it was the overflow of everybody else's work. And guess what they did? They put me right across the desk facing that guy. <laughs> and he had a hard time with this. But make a long story short, anyway, I knew I was supposed to be there. It had nothing to do with my preferences. It had nothing to do with whether I liked it or not. But it did, it did teach me something, though. You're, you, you have to be prepared for the marketplace. I don't care what you can do in church. Anybody can impress somebody in church. Out there is where you spend 98% of your life. That's the real world. That's where you need to be a Christian. And I can still remember when I left, suddenly a job opened up in, uh, in, uh, in, in this machine that I used to run in the factory that paid big money, uh, opened up, they put it up, posted it for union bid, and nobody wanted it. They said it was too hard. And they said, well, we have a record here where this Dennis Clark, he, he's done this job before. I got called up to do it, and I left. And when I left, another guy came in to take my job, and he said he was a Christian, but he was smoking pot. I heard later when I ran into one of the guys that worked there, they said, you know what they did to him? They took him into the, into the uh, room where they pull truck engines out, and they hoisted him on a hook. And they hoisted him up, and they, while he was up, gee, it was like Jesus on the cross. They said, we had a Christian in here. You're not one. <laughs> These are unsaved people. So what did it say? Apparently, with my imperfections, I still was a good enough witness that when someone came, of course, that really didn't appeal if you say I'm a Christian, but then I'm going to go get high with the truckers. You know, that's, you know they read through hypocrisy. Well, they don't have to know the Bible to read through hypocrisy. They, they caught that real quick. So anyway, the, 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 the message is, be the best person you can be on that job. And in some cases, if you're in a bad job for too long, it could be that what needs to be adjusted is not the boss, not the employees, but your attitude. Attitude will determine your performance. 
What you focus on, you give power to what you give attention to, good or bad. And I want you to put your attention on the good things. So fill up, and God will fill up your life. You fill full, and he'll fulfill your destiny, and he can get you back on track. But here's the principle. Those of you who are note takers, you're going to want this, um, because this is what the Lord's been speaking, and, and this is the easiest way to project it, because then you can test yourself by the Word of God as to how am I doing, you know? Uh, I like how-tos. I don't like just truths. I want to know how do I do that, all right? Um, in Ezekiel 44, um, it says, verses 15 and 16, the priests, the Levites, the son of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray, they shall... Here's the four elements. Come near to me to minister to me, and they will stand before me. And there's actually a third step. Draw, write these down if you're a note taker, because this is what we want to cover today. Number one, draw near. Minister to God himself. I'm paraphrasing what he's really saying. Three, and this is so essential. I know, because I was a hyperactive kid. Be still. And fourthly, stand ready to obey. Now look at that again. In other words, these were the ones God honored, that come into the Holy of Holies, that come into the inner court. They draw near to me. Draw near. First of all, I've, we found when we travel, Christians didn't know how to do that. They did it in their head and wondered why they didn't have much of a relationship. Draw near. The, the mystics of old, uh, particularly to Madame Goyon, had an interesting way of explaining it. We know the scripture says, draw near to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Okay, first of all, don't picture God in heaven. The kingdom of God is within you. Draw nigh to him. And she called it the law of central tendency which an easier word would be like spiritual gravity. You give power to what you give attention to. You close your eyes and pray, and you pay attention to your heart, your spirit. Not this heart, by the way. Oh, dear Lord, we went, how many churches we went to, people thought this was their Bible heart. This is where you receive Jesus, here. As a matter of fact, Bob Jones, we did a, uh, that message in... Uh, Connecticut at West Haven at Brian Simmons Church. And Bob Jones was one of the speakers as well as others. And he says, it's like the fruit of the loins. <laughs> kind of a play on the underwear, all right? The fruit of the loins. <laughs> but it is. It's the loins. It's the gut. It's the bowels. That is the actual translation. The gut. So to draw nigh to God is you drop down. Well, drop down in your Bible is put on. Did you ever look in your Bible where it says, put on the new man, put on the Lord Jesus, put on, put on, put on. It means to sink into in order to be clothed. So you drop down before it comes up. You drop down and you get your peace. That's the personal presence of God. And it will guard your heart and your mind. So it has to go up to your mind. But this is where it's guarding your heart and your mind. Peace will guard your heart and your mind. It's militant. And a God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. See, if you don't have a right definition of peace, that doesn't even, you can't even relate to that. The God of peace. Yeah, when you're at peace, you're displacing the powers that be. Real spiritual warfare is not just yelling at the stuff. Real spiritual warfare is when your presence dispels the ungodly presence, displacement. And then what you decree and declare from displacement has power. We have the cart before the horse. We like to say the right answers. But draw near to God. One of the complaints in the Old Testament is, with their lips they praise me. With their lips they're saying all the right stuff, but their heart somewhere else. And that's because they ministered outer court without ministering inner court first. So draw nigh to God, He will draw nigh to you. And here's the beautiful thing about that, that law. 
that when you give attention to the Jesus in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, when you give attention, it builds a magnetic pull. It gets easier and easier till eventually you have dual awareness. You do like when I prayed for these people. I just relax and I can bear witness to what's going on in their spirit regardless of what my head says, regardless of what I see, what I hear. And this is what God wants you to do because each one is drawn away. Picture, what, what's that mean in Scripture? You are drawn away by lust. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Your five senses, taste, touch, smell. You see stuff and you go, oh, donuts. Oh, oh. Well, what's it doing? If you let the senses draw you away, you basically, it's like your bucket goes back up and you're more in your head than you're in your spirit. But if you go, donuts, eh, let it go. You go back to Him. You learn to practice a walk in the Spirit to where you go to Him more regularly or you drop down more regularly. When I married Jennifer, I always like to brag on Jennifer because I'm proud of her. She should be a member of Mensa, really, but she chose not to. She's well above genius IQ, but it took months to get her from her head down to here. Right, Jennifer? And at first she says, I was like a yo-yo. I'd go, oh, what am I going to do? I, oh, Jesus. And then she'd get her piece back. But, but, but what about, what about, oh, Jesus. You can go like that. But eventually it's almost like the cord gets cut and your head can be distracted with thoughts and visuals, but the heart remains peaceful. And, you know, the prophetic words that are coming forth for 2020 are saying, uh, Bob Jones is even saying for the decade, that people are going to enter into a rest that they've never known before. Peace is on every page of your Bible, but it's not like peace, peace. It's some passive, wimpy thing. Peace, the God of peace will crush the enemy beneath your feet. You need to know that He Himself is our peace. And step number one, if you're going to draw near to God, quit calling the Holy Spirit an it. That's terrible. He's a person. Because if you treat him as a person, the tendency would be to respect him. You'll draw nigh to a person. I feel his peace. I feel his presence. He himself is my peace. You will have a tendency to respect him. If, oh, I felt zapped. Okay, that's kind of like, here's the way the Lord taught me. When I was a young kid, I used to like to be a superhero. I would take towels, tie it around my neck, and jump off furniture. Anybody else do that? Come on, somebody did that. All right, superhero, tie a towel around and jump off furniture. All right, so anyway, nobody raised their hand on that, maybe one or two brave people. But uh, anyway, for as foolish as I was, I had that impression of the anointing. I have a mantle. I have a cape. I'm a cape crusader. But what I didn't see was one time, I looked at Gideon who was hiding away in fear in, in uh, Judges chapter 6 and 7. You read the story about Gideon. He was hiding away from the enemy and he, was, and, and he was afraid. And God manifested to him as Jehovah Shalom. So he was afraid, but he manifested as Jehovah Shalom. And the Holy Spirit did this. I'm reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit did this. This is rare. He went... And he made me look at a footnote. I don't know if I was using Spirit-filled Life Bible or what, but it was a footnote. And it said, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. So what did I see? The swashbuckler. And the Spirit took me and had me read a footnote. God can speak through a footnote. He can speak through anything, can He? Well, this footnote said, a better translation would be the Spirit of the Lord put on Gideon. And I saw this. Oh, oh, that's a little different than my vision of, oh, you know, ah, it's the Cape Crusader. No, guys, you're the glove. For it is God who is at work to will and to perform. Huh? It isn't about you. It's about your cooperation. Actually, the grace of God is the ability to obey. And grace the personal presence of Jesus, empowering you to be and to do all that He called you to be and to do. It happens here. 
Anybody else have a problem with my swashbuckler story? It <laughs> devastated me because I was going, whoa, that it's not me. Because, see, I had this concept as a baby Christian where I grabbed Jesus by the hand and I dragged him around telling him what he ought to do until a woman prophesied after she laughed for 10 minutes, after she laughed, what seemed like 10 minutes, she laughed over me. She said, oh, Dennis, the Lord loves your heart, but you're doing it all wrong. You cannot drag Jesus around and tell him what to do. He wants you to follow him. Oh, I have to. So then it's yielding and surrender instead of trying and doing. So we live by dying and we fight by Yielding. <laughs> what? That sounds pretty hard. But if you're going to draw an eye to God, and I learned that the minute I close my eyes, when I start focusing in on Jesus in here, I touched. And the church was always stayed away from feeling. But the problem is, this feeling was spiritual feeling. This was feeling the fruit of the Spirit. I don't want a theoretical fruit of the Spirit. That's, that's like the, I, had some, I had some faith friends that basically, I had the joy of the Lord by faith. Well, you're saying the right answer, but quite frankly, I don't want your joy. <laughs> you look depressed to me. I know, you're, I know what you meant. You're trying to get out of the depression by saying the right answer. But why not go to the anger that's inside you and the condemnation, and bring it to the cross, and then say the right answer. We we'll skip the cross. So God's basically saying, draw nigh to me, you've got to learn to touch, and then be aware. And how are you going to do this if you don't know your, your thoughts are here, your mind is here, your will is here. 98% of the church does not know where their will is. They think it's here. Consent Yield the will and obey, and God will direct your path. Trust, trust in the Lord. That's here. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your understanding. Trust in the Lord, and He will direct your path. How will He direct my path? From the heart. I mean, we had people that revolutionized their churches with one teaching that we did. Unless you forgive from the heart. Forgiveness is instant. When I married Jennifer, she was trying to forgive somebody for two years. I'm going, guess what? You're doing that mentally. And you're sincere. That adds a level of complication, doesn't it? A sincere person does not like to be corrected. But I said, here, I want you to try something. Close your eyes. Put your hand here. That person, you see that person? Mm -hmm. And down here, every thought has a corresponding emotion. And down here it was, and I go, receive forgiveness from the forgiver who lives in you down here, not heaven, in here, and let forgiveness flow to that person you see in your head and it changed to peace. That is a supernatural exchange. It's just like the new birth. It's the same way you got born again. But the church is not teaching this to people, unfortunately. They're just giving you the right answers. I don't know about you, but I always wanted to know, how do I do that? Matter of fact, people from our church drive other preachers crazy because they walk up to them and they say, well, how do you do that? <laughs> right? But that's good. They need to have an answer for that. How do you do that? Now, draw near. All right, let's suppose that you learn how to draw near to God. What's the second step? The second step is <clears throat> from, from draw near. <clears throat> Hmm? Minister to God. I have my pages all mixed up here. God wants you to come to Him. Jonah 2.8 in the message translation, those who worship idols, anything other than God, putting anything before Him is an idol, walk away from their tr only true love. That really hit me. That's a good one to look at. Jonah 2.8. An idol can be something that's good, but it's more important to you than God. Anyone who basically forsakes their only true love for an idol, think about it. Is it really worth it? Do you really have to have it? As a matter of fact, that's how you can tell it's an idol. That's how you can tell there's an attachment. 
It's when you drop down to your spirit and you can't let it go. And you justify it. And you say, what a good thing it is. Even ministry. One of the saddest examples was one time I had a man who says, God clearly spoke to me to come to your church. What? He clearly spoke? That's pretty easy. He could speak to go to somebody else's church. But I have a men's group that depends on me. So let me translate. He had such a need to be needed that he couldn't obey what God clearly told you to do. That has to die. That's idolatry. That's like, he doesn't want your sacrifice. God's given you a capacity to hear and obey. Sacrifices he don't want. But people have a tendency, and this is what, this is to me the word of the Lord for 2020. It's an abomination to do the works for God without having drawn near to him and hearing him. Now the message translation of seek first the kingdom, everybody knows that. Well, first of all, you can't seek first the kingdom without seeking the king. King and kingdom, one and the same. Seek first the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. And don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, he'll, he'll take care of tomorrow when tomorrow happens. You seek first the kingdom. And the message does a beautiful how-to in there. In seeking first the kingdom, it says seek first, steep yourself. Remember we talked about this last week, like a tea bag in water. Steep. Steep yourself in God reality. God initiative. Ah, there's the key. Most people would rather do the wrong thing than wait, and they're terrified by doing nothing. I know I was. I have to do something. I can't just sit still. I'm a hyperactive kid. And God said, sit still. Oh, because you haven't, you haven't even heard anything worth repeating or ministering if you haven't heard it from Him. If you haven't heard anything, you don't have anything to say, in other words. And I was a talker. And He taught me that the hard way, too, because it would be like I'd be praying and He'd say, Ah, oh, Rivers. I would interrupt God when He would give me a word that had an anointing on it. And say, oh, there's a river that makes glad the city of our God. And I would tell God everything I knew about the river and realize the anointing was lifting. Are you sensitive enough to know when that happens? Are you sensitive enough to know when you're in a group setting and you're talking that you probably should shut up? Everybody else's spirit is going, I wish they'd shut up. And you are clueless to it. That means there's a drivenness a religious spirit that drives or impels you to perform rather than obey. I learned that one the hard way. I used to go to this little meeting as a baby Christian and a pastor sat around and he would teach. He would ask people to share. And then I'd blurt something out because I just knew I had the mind of the spirit. And I'd blurt it out and it was so good. And then I would feel after I blurted it out, <laughs> you know what that meant? You shouldn't have said it. You don't have to say everything you know. Oh, that was a radical revelation. I thought that if you use what you have, you get more. And God said, yeah, but that doesn't apply when it comes to wisdom. Wisdom's the principal thing. It's not what you know. It's the application of what you know. There's a time to speak and there's a time to shut up. <laughs> oh, I didn't know I hijacked that meeting, but I did. Have you ever been in a meeting where someone hijacked it? That's not very pleasant. They have such a need to be needed that it's basically they need to bring that to the cross and become part of something bigger than yourself. And usually they're not vulnerable either. They don't open up to anybody. They want to minister to everybody but open to no one. That's scary. I don't let people like that minister to me. Oh, but I want to just go do my thing. I want to be able to do this and I want to do that. Do, 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 do. But your heart isn't been initiated by God. And anybody can do, do, do. Many will say, Lord, Lord, and not enter the realm of God's Spirit for you. Now, if the ministering to God, God's basically saying, don't you understand? I want you to make me your greatest treasure. 
I want you to search for me so I can reveal myself to you. I want you to trust me so I can guide you. I want you to praise me so I can give you my presence. It's rigged in your favor if you cooperate. God wants you to worship him and adore him. He's not an it. Those who worship in the Holy of Holies receive the anointing and the power to minister to the people. Now, the, th the third element, I want to pray for people, so I'm going to kind of move quickly with this. The third element, and this was one of the toughest for me, was sit still. Dennis was a hyperactive kid. And you know what? As a Christian, you can develop Christian habits to compensate for your inability to sit still. Mm -hmm. I pray in tongues for a half hour. Well, that's a good thing to do, but not if it's compensating for the fact that you didn't get in the presence of God. And so what the Lord had to use with me to get me still before you pray in tongues for half an hour, before you do stuff, how about try this, Dennis? How about basically draw near to me, sink into my presence, and he used Psalm 131 verse 2. We use this in our training exercises a lot. This is David saying, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. All right, here's what that looks like. Here's Dennis. As a matter of fact, the teacher once called my mother because she said, uh, Dennis is getting good grades, but he sits and shuffles at his desk. And it's made, I made the teacher nervous because... You know, the teacher's sitting there going, oh, dear Lord, is this kid got to go to the bathroom? What is it? What's wrong with this kid? He's, is there something wrong? Is there something troubling him at home? My mom goes, nope, that's the way he is. So what did God do is he says, I'm going to teach you to sit still. That means not pace and pray, not pray in tongues, activating my vocal cords. I'm going to have you sit still and touch me spirit to spirit until those wild thoughts that wants to go do something and that impulse that wants to walk around and pace until you wean it of its power. You give power to what you give attention to. And you know what? It works. And the learning curve is fast to whosoever will try it. It did not take years. It just took, this is important to learn how to be still. Because when I'm still and wait upon the Lord, He renews my spiritual strength like you can't do by all your sacrifices. I've given you a capacity to hear and obey. I don't want your sacrifices. That's religion. You're driven. You're, you're, you're driven is a sign you've got religious spirits, by the way. Driven. God doesn't drive. God leads. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. And He comes from the place of peace. And peace precipitates the power. So I sat still, and here's what I noticed. As I yielded to Him, didn't fidget, I could bring thoughts that were going like, but what about an oil change today in the truck? What? And I'd bring it to Jesus. And sometimes I'd even write it down, oil change. Do it later. Yield. But eventually you get to the point you don't have to write nothing down. That's, that's a temporary thing to get you back on focusing on Him. And then all of a sudden, how you know you're there and you've weaned the flesh or you've quieted your soul, mind, will, and emotions, they're not taking off somewhere, is all of a sudden time. You entered into from soul time to spirit time. And you can feel like, wow, where did the time go? Until you're there, you're not there. Now that's, that's a hard message for a hyperactive kid. And if you're not hyperactive as an adult, you should be able to get there even easier than I did. Because the learning curve is fast if you say this is important. I've got to learn to be still. Put on the Lord Jesus. He, you can't put him on by decreeing and declaring. I put on the Lord Jesus. I do, I, I've had people, even, even people that needed emotional healing on fear. <gasps> Perfect love can't stop fear. Perfect love can't stop fear. You're emanating fear. You're saying the right answer, but your heart's not in the right place. You can say the right answer and be accomplishing nothing. So for all of those who are real good at confessing Scripture, make sure that it's from the heart. 
because I got a lot of it memorized in my head. But I want it to come from the heart. And peace precedes your perception. Love precedes peace. Peace precedes your discernment. All right. So teach me, God, to steep like a tea bag. into God reality. Because if I steep in God reality and I quiet my flesh, God speaks really clear, then God initiative takes over. And it's the opposite of dead works. It's God initiative. And anything God initiates, the next step happens. God provision. He always provides what He initiates. He doesn't have to bless your good ideas. If you've seen some ministry that you've done and you tried this and you tried that and it fell flat and it didn't work, that's not God. You have to look seriously at yourself to see whether or not it was God initiated or self initiated. If you've been in the church for years and years and years and never really accomplished much, I promise you, you came up, you had good ideas that were not God ideas. John Bevere wrote a whole book on that. Good is not necessarily God, right? And to know the difference, it requires the discernment. So draw near to God. Learn to minister to Him first before you go do anything. Learn that part of that is learning to sit still and steep in the reality so that the initiative, you know, it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work to will and to perform. But that also implies you getting out of the way with your good ideas. God will work and perform, but you yield to that performance. It's empowerment. Grace is not just unmerited favor. Grace is the power to obey God. Grace is the power to not sin. Grace is the power to be and to do all that He called you to be and all that He called you to do. You need to see it more like a power than something you get for nothing. John Bevere uh, quoted in one of his books uh, that, that survey they took throughout the church. 98% of the church could not give a definition of grace other than you are saved by grace, unmerited favor. Did you notice what's wrong with that definition? Nothing. But it's all about you and what you got for nothing. It has nothing to do with how you live the life, the empowerment to be, the empowerment to do all that He called you to be, all that He called you to do, how to obey and not sin. That's where grace is the most sufficient. It's not just what you get for nothing without any effort. You're saved by grace through faith. It's the gift of God. That was a gift. But isn't it interesting, 98% of the church, that's the only definition they would give for grace? It's pretty shallow. You should be understanding thoroughly that grace is the personal presence of Jesus in you, empowering you to be and to do. And if you can't remember that definition, it's the power to obey. <laughs> it's the power to not sin. Grace is His presence, empowerment. Now, to the degree that you learn to resist the world, the flesh, and the devil, you mature. To the degree you learn to resist with the, with the Holy Spirit, but to, to the degree that you maintain peace, you are resisting. You're not only resisting, you're ruling. Let the peace of God rule. When you have peace, you may not uh, have it all together, but if you're at peace at that moment, Jesus is ruling. That's Lordship. And you see where the church is going to change in 2020? And this is going to be hard, but you watch it with your eyes. I might be with Jesus before this is all done, but I don't really care. I'll tell you what. Entertainment is going to die, and discipleship is going to come on the increase. Entertainment is what you get for nothing. Discipleship is lordship. The transition that the church has to make is to go from entertainment to lordship. Is he truly lord on the job? Is he truly lord in the home? Is He truly Lord? That means, does the peace of God rule most of the time in your life? And if you lose it, you can always get back there. Remember Jason's illustration. I say this in almost every sermon because you're going to remember it that way. 
I am not repeating because I'm getting old. Uh, that my teaching technique is to repeat some of the same stuff over and over again until it's in there for good. Three kinds of people in the Bible. Wise. A wise man does this, right? Right, you've read that. Foolish. A wise, foolish, and evil. Uh, I mean, there's evil people? Mm-hmm. Yep. But how does it, how do you know how those three operate? The wise person listens to instruction, even if you don't like what you heard. You went, ugh, but if that's the truth, <laughs> I can, I'm going to do it. Oh, God. Oh, uh, ooh, uh. That's a wise person. That's teachable. This is another way to say it. Teachable. Foolish. And our culture's doing this left and right. You know people. You know Christians that are doing this one. The foolish is you are so shaped by the culture, you're changing Scripture to make it more comfortable. Foolish can eventually lead to evil. You stay foolish and you don't deal with the reality of what God says, there's two roads, and great is the chasm. One leads to life, one leads to death. That was taught in the first century church in the Didache. They taught Gentiles who were clueless. We're living in that kind of era right now. The Jews had a foundation, right? They had Ten Commandments. They knew you don't murder. But the Gentiles came in. They murdered babies. They left them out in the cold. It was, but it was culturally acceptable. They had to teach them there's two roads. There's a road of life and there's a road of destruction. And great is the chasm between the two. Choose this day which road you're going to walk. But first they had to teach them this is right and this is wrong. Foolish people fix the right and wrong to be convenient so they can be popular, so they can be with the majority or whatever. God's basically saying that in that stillness, you're going to get so much closer to me that you're going to be in a position to where you stand. And what do you mean stand? Stand ready to obey God initiative. Not your ideas, not your cleverness. I will obey what God does. I'm not going to try to make anything happen. I shared this last week, and it, so, it, so, it sounds like I keep talking about all the stuff that I did, but all the stuff that I did, I didn't know what I was doing. Do you understand that? Pastors came and copied my infrastructure from my first church, and I found it amusing because I didn't have any idea what I was doing. I just obeyed the next step that God told me that I knew was God. And somehow, in hindsight, I look back, it worked. I did not have a marvelous plan. I did not have something somebody could copy. All I had was baby steps of obedience builds, because it's God initiative, it builds provision. And you fulfill your destiny. So, Father, right now, I just believe in the name of the Lord Jesus, God wants you to fill full so that you can fulfill your destiny. God's basically saying, I'm not going to ask you to do stuff that I didn't ask you to do. You don't need to ask yourself to do something that I never intended you to do. I want you to get to the place where you basically just stand ready to obey God. It's not entertainment, it's lordship. So, Father, open my heart. I mean, as I open my heart, I am God welcoming your initiative, your ideas. And if I've got an agenda that's got me in it, then let it die. Let it die to my vision that yours would come up more clearly so that I can fulfill the purposes that I have. I've got lots of good ideas, but I'm going to die to my ideas. And I want you to be my exceedingly great reward. In Ezekiel 44, those sons of Zadok, God says, 
I'm going to be their inheritance. They're not going to get an inheritance. Those that came before me, that waited upon me to obey me, they're going to find such a rich satisfaction in me, they're not going to want an inheritance. I will be their exceedingly great reward. Don't you want that? Do you want stuff or do you want him? If he's your reward, you don't need anything else. Now, in conclusion, I'm going to give you the pattern that God taught me over the years is still working in me, but it works. He said, first of all, if you're going to be a disciple and you're going to get into discipleship, you've got to draw near to God. Here's how you can tell if you're making any kind of progress. Remember, you give power to what you give attention to. So, first you've got to learn that when you close your eyes, you've got to get to the point where you touch God and know that you're touching God. You're not just thinking. It's going to be drink and feed instead of think and read. Thinking and reading is okay, but you have to know the difference between thinking and reading, drinking and feeding. Your word was found and I did eat, and it was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. That's an experience. That's not information. All right? But here's what the, what the, the way the Lord did. Now, I want you to write this. It's in, our, it's in uh, the will of God as a river in the end. I think it's in the last chapter. But here's the way the Lord taught me. He said, first you learn to touch me spirit to spirit. Get out of your head. Quiet your flesh long enough. Touch. And here's what happens. This is what surprised Jennifer because in 60 days, her mentor said, what happened to you? I got her out of her head, and touch changed to embrace. Is embrace better than touching? Yeah. yeah. And so I said, by continually giving God, and I was like a yo-yo when I started too, just like Jennifer, but in a short period of time, weeks, you go from touch and awareness to an embrace. That's the law of central tendency, or Madame Guyon called that. That's the gravity, spiritual gravity, that you go to him, he runs to you. Here's a picture of that. It's like when the prodigal came back, like you or I, <laughs> coming back to the father. What was the father doing? He was running toward him. That's what happens here. You draw nigh to God, he runs towards you. You might be taking baby steps, that's okay. You take those baby steps. Baby steps builds spiritual prowess. Touch leads to embrace. You stay in the embrace and you fall so in love with His presence. Doing stuff doesn't have the appeal. You don't want to leave that presence. It's addictive. You become ad addicted in a good way to His presence. And that embrace, pay attention, that embrace, if you pay attention to what's going on, after you touch, and touch leads to embrace, embrace leads to a satisfaction that you are missing in most of your Christian life. Well, how did you try to get satisfied in Christian? Doing stuff. I watched young believers burn out doing stuff. If you're burning out doing stuff, you don't, shouldn't be doing it. It's not God leading you. He don't burn you out. Touch leads to embrace. Embrace brings a satisfaction. Now here's the part that joy rises up when I even talk about it. Satisfaction was about me. I felt spiritually satisfied in Him. But you know what it did? It's kind of a, it's kind of a trick, a good trick. A Jehovah tricky right here. You know what He did? That satisfaction is so real, you want to reciprocate. So now it's not just about me, it's about, I, oh God, that is so good, I want to give you all. You want to transfer and reconcile all of that good satisfaction, satisfy back. Does this sound too hard? Would you rather do something? Would you rather just get busy and do some religious function? That's what happens. But this satisfaction, I want you to reciprocate. It basically points to 
to abounding love. You know, you read that in the scripture, let your love abound, overflow. How do you do that? This is how you do it. If you don't have that satisfaction, we love because He first loved us. If you don't get that satisfaction, what you're giving is dead. Good intentions, sincerity. You know, God's tired of sincerity and being sincerely wrong. With their lips they praise me, but their heart's not there. They're doing dead works. I'm releasing that satisfaction. I want to satisfy the heart of God. You know what that's also preparing you for? Like the sons of Zadok, you don't need an inheritance in stuff. Your inheritance is Him. So you're releasing that satisfaction. All right? What's that satisfaction do? It points to overflowing love. We love because He first loved us. You can't love with your own human love. This is, we love with that same love that He satisfied my heart with, and it's overflowing. You know what that points to? The next revelation for the church, the heart of the Father. Overflowing love points to the heart of the Father. Oh, oh if it overflows in the heart of the Father, if that's the heart of the Father, then what is that anointing going to do? What is the heart of the Father? What is the eternal purpose in Ephesians? What is His overall plan? Not the little, little tiny specifics. What is the heart or the passion of God the Father? To bring many sons unto glory. And you can't bring somebody to something you don't have. You have to be a son unto the Father before you can ever be father unto sons. But yet that is the call. I speak to you, little children, because you've known Him who was from the beginning. I speak to you, young men, because the Word of God abides in you and you're strong and you've overcome the wicked one. I speak to you, fathers. What do fathers do? They want to bring sons to glory. They want to bring them into a deeper dimension of the Spirit. They want discipleship. You know, we picture that, go we into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know how that's usually perceived? Go get somebody converted, baptize them in the Spirit and in water, and they're done. No, no, no. That's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says, go ye into all the world, immersing them in the reality of the Father, immersing them in the reality of the Son, immersing them in the reality of the Holy Spirit. That's discipleship. Go into the world, make disciples, not converts, disciples. And the church is going to change from entertainment to discipleship. And our small groups are doing that. And if you have a hard time in our small group, go somewhere else. <laughs> really. Because they're doing exactly what I've instructed them to do. And it's to be accountable and to be discipled and to grow. I don't care what you did in your church. <laughs> because historically, the heads of house group ministries around the country admit it, it didn't work well. And where did it fail, historically? John Wesley did it in England, but it didn't work in America. Why? Because when it came to America, they went to Bible studies and prayer groups where you just ministered, everybody had a word for everybody, and everybody uh, left bleed, came bleeding and left bleeding. But they ministered. My house group leaders are trained and they're doing exactly what we call them to do. We're not changing it for your opinion. We don't care what your opinion is, really. Go somewhere else and do it. But I'm believing that God is, is discipling. I'm, we're not trying to entertain or be entertained. We're trying to grow a people, to make ready a people prepared for what God's got in store in the days ahead. And it's going to require discipleship, not, not playing church. You know what they said in Iran? When they walk out of their house as a believer, they stand a chance of being arrested and killed. Just walking out the door of their house. That's potential. But they said the converts run when trouble comes. And the disciples draw near to Jesus. Hmm? Jesus would preach. He'd say stuff that made some people walk away. But then he would pour into his disciples. 
takes a different kind of heart attitude, doesn't it, to be a disciple? Convert. It's easy to get born again. I remember Watchman Nee always said, the release of the Spirit. One of the first books I read as a little baby Christian. Release of the Spirit. He said, the church, it's easy to get Jesus in somebody. It's when trying to release Jesus out of somebody is a whole other thing because they put walls up and they go, I'm just going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. So he's literally in there, but he's living a confined, restricted life. Let him out. And at that time, my sister was doing the, the, we had cassette tapes. She was doing the titles. And so she titled it, How to Get God Out of Your Life. <laughs> That's not quite what I was trying to get at, but releasing the Spirit is not how to get God out of your life, how to get a release from the God in you to be a blessing to other people. Father, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if there's sickness or disease in this room, I want you to stand up. Any kind of sickness, stand up. I want to pray for healing right now. Sickness, any kind of sickness, any kind of threat that you're trying to get rid of. Father, in the name of Jesus, we need some sovereign miracles here. We need instant, progressive healings. But we're going to hold our heart open and watch the miracle-working power of God. Miracle-working power flowing out of us in Jesus' name. I want to hear testimonies, too. Don't ever hesitate not to share what it is because it's, it, we've seen people that when you share a testimony, people watching on YouTube identify with it and they get healed just from your testimony. There's something about a testimony that carries an anointing with it. It's not just a clever statement. It carries the resurrection substance on it. So, Father, we just release healing to flow to this physical body. And here's the way Jennifer and I have done it for years. All right, we, Every cell in your physical body that's every system in your whole body from head to toe. Every cell has gates and channels. We say, open up, ye gates, and let the King of glory come in. Let Jesus the healer, Jehovah Rapha, he is, I am a God-welcoming person, and I am yielding every cell in my physical body to the presence of a healing God. I welcome him in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a nice anointing on this. Whoa. Whoa, increase, increase, physical healing and health. And here's what I want you to do. If you get instant, testify. You feel a difference in your body. If you could do something you couldn't do before, do it. But if it's a progressive one, here's what I want you to do because this is a mistake Christians make. Down here is where your heart is, the door. Leave the premises without a manifestation of your healing, but don't shut this door. Hold the heart open. How many healings have we seen? In four, we have better health now at our age than we had when we were 30 and 40. But a lot of them were not instant, but we never shut down. Hope deferred is like closing the door. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But desire realized may take time. So I hold the heart open that God will do whatever He wants to do whenever He wants to do it. And we thank you for this in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.